What I took from uh, both uh, speakers was that um, there's always something better we can do, each one of us can do. And uh, this might uh, awaken something in one of you. I know I learn every time I give my talks uh, just to recognize how you might be thinking of something in a way that you might recognize has a, um, a racist or a sexist or classist uh, tinge on it. And that's because this is our society and, and we're all products of our society. So um, I will touch on uh, race, gender, and class. Um, but first, let's talk about me. Um, these are my parents, uh, and if you've heard me speak before, I apologize. I have no new jokes, so um, you just got to bear with me. Uh, my dad originally from Basra, Iraq, uh, and uh, he graduated from secondary school, went on to Baghdad University College of Sciences, did well enough there to earn a government scholarship to do his graduate studies overseas, and uh, ended up at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he met another graduate student, a nice Jewish girl from New York. So, uh, though the context has been changed in, uh, in American uh, culture and society today, uh, with an Arab father and an Ashkenazi Jewish mother, I'm actually 100% Semite. So, you can insult either side of my family, and that would uh, classify as anti-Semitic. Um, but then, also with an Arab father and Jewish mother, I'm going to be in therapy for a long time. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, this is, uh, uh, my parents got married in 1968, had my sister in 1969, and then their lives dramatically improved in 1971 when I came along. Uh, now, I'm six months old. Of course, I don't remember this picture being taken, <coughs> but uh, for any of us, the, the memories we have of our childhood from before the time that our brains could make memories are from the pictures. So um, this is me in uh, six months old, June 1972, in our backyard in Basra. After my father finished his PhD, uh, he had to pay back that government scholarship by teaching at Basra University for five years. So the first five years of my life were spent between Iraq and the U.S., when you're a kid, you think everybody does that, but apparently that's not the case. But uh, so that's where uh, that's where I was at six months old. And when you talk to me about Iraq, I think of this. But unfortunately, we've been trained to think of this, and therein lies the problem. Governments take their actions for their greed, their uh, lust for power, control of oil, if you will. But every country is made up of families, and it's those families who pay the price. Uh, whether it's the over 4,500 families who've lost their loved ones in wars based on lies because they don't include the number who've died in Afghanistan to keep that number low. There's a whole lot they don't include. It's actually closer to 15,000 American dead in those wars. Uh, whether it's the uh, people of New Orleans who've yet to be able to return home uh, almost three years after Hurricane Katrina hit, whether it's the people who fell to their deaths in Minneapolis, because while we send billions to fund an illegal occupation overseas, our infrastructure is falling apart here, or whether you're talking about 26 million Iraqis who are paying the highest price for the actions of our government. And this is an Iraqi family. There's my dad, my sister on your right, and me. And this is an American family. There's my dad, my sister on your right, and me. Oh, look alike. I was born in New York, my sister was born in D.C., and my dad became an American citizen in the 1980s. So when you talk about shock and awe of Iraq, to me it's the same thing as the shock and awe of Yonkers, New York. And it needs to be the same thing to more people. These were my mom's parents, Ashkenazi Jews, who fled their homeland of Austria during Hitler's Anschluss. Uh, they came here literally running for their lives. They made it to New York to start a new life. So unfortunately, now I have genocide on both sides of my family, but it's for both sides and uh, the new family I have today through this work that I do what I do. And that includes you. All right, I am not responsible for hair or wardrobe in this book. <laughs> this is 1976, and this is in our backyard in Iraq. We, as I said, we live there. I know, I don't know what she was thinking. But um, we lived there until 1977. Uh, that was our last return to the U.S. My father always intending for the family to go back, at least just to visit. Uh, you see one of our cats up on the, up on the ledge, up on the right. Um, but uh, 1980, the Iran-Iraq War started. That lasted for eight years. Uh, by that time, my sister's in college. I'm a junior in high school. Uh, and before you know it, August 2nd, 1990 rolls around and Iraqi troops had moved into Kuwait. 
Uh, so four days later, economic sanctions were imposed. Five months later, the Gulf War came, which was 42 days of bombing. Uh, I moved away from the East Coast. Um, <laughs> I grew up in the Northeast because I don't really do well with three consecutive days of rain. But we bombed them for 42 straight days. No less. Uh, then, of course, sanctions continued, killing uh, an estimated, uh, really by uh, 1995 on, uh, 5,000 children every month. People were starving to death, including my family. The only reason I have family to visit today is because my father was in the States and able to send money. Um, so finally, shock and awe came, and I was like, that's it. We keep waiting for things to get better, and they keep getting worse, so I'm going to go back and visit. And uh, I took my first trip back in 27 years uh, and uh, went to visit my family and, of course, meeting uh, most, of my, most of my family I'd never known before because they were born after, after I'd left, even, even my uh, first cousins. But this is uh, my cousin's son. Ali, he's not real sure of me yet. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and thing, he couldn't. He was uh, uh, almost three in this, in this picture. He'll be five on June thirtieth, and uh, he, did, he was too young to understand different countries, different languages, long distances. So he really could not understand why this adult relative just didn't know how to speak Arabic. Because actually, my parents spoke English at home when I was little. My dad only used Arabic. When so I can yell at you swearing very, very well, very effectively, and I'm told it's but this is not something to share with the family in my first visit back. But anyway, these are the little ones, and the older ones, one of my cousins, who I met for the first time, and that really brought things home. I was pretty unhappy in my medical career. I uh, was in my last year of training in anesthesiology, also at Georgetown University. Uh, and uh, really just completely burnt out. This was during the run-up to the invasion and uh, was very depressed and then took the opportunity to go see my family and then realized what, what real suffering was. So, um, and I had a lot of guilt because I knew it was my tax dollars that had done it. But, um, so I will touch a little bit on uh, our institutionalized racism directed towards Iraqis. Uh, if you look up a definition of racism, it's the belief that race accounts for differences in human character or ability, and that a particular race is superior to others, or it's discrimination or prejudice based on race, basically the deni denial of the other's humanity, whoever that other might be, um, in a way that we don't respect them as human beings with lives as valuable as our own or whoever the oppressor is. Now, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sentiment in this country has been honed to a T over decades. Um, three representations of Arabs or Muslims in the media, camel jockeys, oil shakes, or terrorists. It's very difficult to find these boots on career day, okay? So now, but in our media, they have been reinforced since movies first started to be made. Uh, I grew up with movies like Eddie Murphy's Best Defense, of course, any episode or any any um, sequel or prequel or issue of Delta Force movies, uh, rules of engagement, where they show uh, Arab children carrying weapons. So you see, these people are you know not like us. These are these images are reinforced. Rendition, where some of the Arabs are good, some of them are bad. You just can't tell them apart. They all look alike. The Kingdom, I haven't seen. I don't feel bad about that. Any episode of 24 where the Arabs are coming to kill us, Aladdin. This movie came out when I was an intern with the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which I'm not affiliated with anymore. It's pretty much sold out to the Washington establishment, but it's another lecture. Um, Aladdin, the movie opens with, uh, in song, they say uh, that this, where Aladdin is growing up, is a place where they cut off your nose if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. And so our campaign that summer was to try to get Disney to take that out, because that wasn't real cool. Um, and then so if the kids are well, going to the movies to watch Aladdin, they can come home and get those negative stereotypes reinforced um, with video games. Desert Storm, Call of Duty, Rainbow Six. And that starts at maybe like five to ten years old and goes all the way until they deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, this is my cousin, very sweet. In this picture, um, I'm standing with him. He's very shy. 
Um, but uh, this was the text message he sent me when I was going, when I left the country, and, and they were very worried about me because I was traveling by myself once they got me to the border. So thank goodness now we have cell phones because the house phone just came on last week after it's been down for six months. One of the reasons for that is that um, I believe, um, well, it was confirmed by one of the um, veterans that uh, landline communications are more difficult to intercept than cell phone communications. Um, but uh, whether that specifically is why the phone was down for six months, I don't know. But they all have cell phones now. So they let me know that they, they made it back to the house from dropping me off at the border okay. Um, now, uh, he has his degree in economics, would love to get a job in his field so he can have a, a, a reputable job so he can get married and uh, move on with his life. But um, because American companies are, uh, are in charge and just like they put Americans out of work here by outsourcing, they're bringing in cheap labor from Indonesia and Southeast Asia, um, which turns into slave labor because they uh, take their passports from them and then they're trapped there. Um, but that explains the high level of unemployment in Iraq. So he's doing, he's doing oil changes for cars, which is, you know, that's honest work, but it's a waste of an educated man. Uh, this is the future of Iraq, and he's not being allowed to participate um, in that future. So that's my cousin. Educated, hardworking, very sweet, big heart, compassionate. But when he went out to go buy bread for the family on a cold winter's night, that's what he looked like. I told him, give me the V, I'm taking your picture. Automatically, my mind has been trained to think enemy combatant, terrorist, hates Americans, wants to kill us. It's the same kid. And I would be so spooked because I knew the British were, f I was in Basra in 2006, I knew the British would be around. Oftentimes the electricity would go out, so he's riding his bike completely in the dark. And all you need is one scared or trigger-happy soldier. And my cousin's gone. And this is happening every day in Iraq. Every day at checkpoints. This is another cousin, also because he's an Iraqi military-aged male, might be mistaken for a terrorist or a person of interest or a potential insurgent. By the way, do you know how many insurgents there are in Iraq? By my definition, zero. There is legitimate resistance to illegal occupation. And insurgency is, is a, has a negative connotation to resist a legitimate government. There is no legitimate government in Iraq. There is a puppet government. And the representative of the old state, which is the only legitimate representation of the Iraqi people, is fighting to kick us out and them along with them. And this also, I'm leaving, I'm going home, they're praying for me. And these little babies, <laughs> I won't even recognize them today. I hope I get to go back at some point to visit. The little one was just one month old um, when this picture was taken, so she'll be uh, over two now. And her older sister will be over four, maybe four and a half. Um, so, and this is, uh, of course, me there with them, but uh, women and children. And if you heard me speak at the end of Empire panel, you know that women and children are the majority of any population. Half male, half female, out of the women, the girls, and the boys. Anywhere you go, that's the majority. They pay the highest price. And the reason I show these images whenever I give talks around the country is to show women and children because, and that's actually, I'm trying to use it to my advantage these days, because when people think of Arabs and Muslims, we've been trained to think mm -hmm. of militant, military-aged males. So. I don't, I know, I have yet to encounter problems at the airport, but my friends who are Arab, or sorry, my friends who are males, they run into trouble. So I'm like, you know what, you guys are going to be detained and questioned. Meanwhile, <coughs> let's go, we're moving on with the revolution. They don't even know we exist. <laughs> but anyway, uh, anywhere you go in the world, wherever there is no law and order, it's women and children who pay the highest price, because they are the most susceptible to the crimes of violence and kidnapping. And whenever you hear in the news that we're dropping bombs on insurgent strongholds or insurgent safe houses, those pilots can't see who's hiding in those homes. And they are homes. And most of the time, it's women and children trying to stay safe from the violence in the streets. Racism, that's very straightforward. Dehumanization of the enemy, we have a long history of it. I'm pretty sure when I was, growing, when I was in middle school, 
I was taught about the savages that were removed when the Europeans moved west in this country. And that was not that long ago. In Vietnam, of course, there were no Vietnamese people. There were goops. And I've heard Vietnam veterans talk about how, you know, they, they were looking around for a new animal, quite literally. Um, but the reality was that's how people were dehumanized. And it starts with the soldiers themselves. Because part of basic training is dehumanizing the soldiers. They sign up, well, they get lied to a lot of the time, especially today. And they take them in, and once they've signed the papers, then they basically take their hair away from them. Everybody's getting the same haircut. And they take their clothes away from them. Everybody's going to wear the same thing. And all of a sudden, you start losing your identity bit by bit. And your closest, who all, you know, all of us, who are we closest with, or we hope to be closest with, our parents. So they start standing over you, screaming in your ear, insulting your mother. What is that all about? This is not healthy. That's not. I don't want my. I wouldn't. I don't want them to do that to my dog, let alone you know a child. And I don't have kids, so I, I won't even you know I can't even measure what what the parents go through. But but once you're dehumanized, it's easier to pass that forward. Uh, in Vietnam, I knew the number fifty-eight thousand from years ago, but it was only through my work more recently that I actually came across the number of three million dead Vietnamese. 58,000 was more than enough dead for us to handle, but it was nothing compared to the devastation of Vietnam. And we're seeing the same thing today. Even if you give a more accurate number of 15,000 dead Americans, because the Pentagon's number means those who have died in the sands of Iraq by, by, in a combat situation. If you are transported to Landstuhl, Germany, and you die there from your injuries, you don't get counted. If you come home and you die from your injuries, you don't get counted. If you come home and die from infection, you don't get counted. And if you come home and you're so traumatized by what your government sent you, sent you to be involved in, and you kill yourself, which happens 15 times a day in this country, you don't get counted in the final tally. So bump it up to 15,000, maybe at this point closer to 20,000. That doesn't even count the wounded, physically and psychologically. In Iraq, it's over 1.2 million dead. In a country that's slightly larger than the size of California. A country of 26 million. And every day, it's growing higher. Essentially, these lives are disposable. And I'll talk briefly, I'm sorry, I'm going on way too long. But I'll talk briefly about how we're doing it both with, uh, within our, our military and within our own society and with Iraqis. Disposable, designed to be used once and then thrown away. In 2003, General Tommy Franks, who, you know, if this will affect where you go out, um, he has, uh, he owns part of Outback Steakhouse. So, um, I, so if you're not a vegetarian already, just so you know, Outback. Now, I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> General Tommy Franks, we don't do body counts. This is not something we're going to follow. Colin Powell, heralded as a hero, despite the fact that his military career really started to accelerate when he had a desk job in Vietnam, his responsibility was to cover up massacres like My Lai. Um, that, was, that was his role in Vietnam, which is why he made it to be Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. Iraqi civilian dead, it's really not a number I'm terribly interested in. Okay, all right then. Well, what happens is this gets translated into our policy. And uh, the second major siege of Fallujah, uh, this is an article called U.S. Launches Mass Slaughter in Fallujah preceded by airstrikes where half of the mosques were destroyed. Fallujah was known as the city of mosques. Over 120 mosques, 60 of them gone. What would we do if another air force came here and started bombing churches? That would be problematic for us. In addition, despite the fact that hospitals are supposed to be protected by the Geneva Conventions, the Nizal Emergency Hospital was, was leveled to the ground and the Fallujah General Hospital was seized. And this is what was going on in the hospital. Now I understand that soldiers are given the instruction they have to secure the area for their own safety and the safety of their buddies beside them, which means uh, securing anyone who's a potential threat, any military-aged male Iraqi. So that's what's happening with these individuals. But I just want to point out that they're in scrubs and wearing white coats, and he's got a stethoscope around his name. There's no thought for these people as human beings 
very educated human beings who would be helping any of them who got injured in addition to their own patients. That's the reality. They're tied up and secured on the floor. We have to stay and help. This is one of the most racist things I have heard. The idea that how are these people going to make it through the desert without America? All right, well, we have less than 300 years of history, which is not really democratic if you think about it. They have over 7,000 years of civilization. Now, I pose these questions because of the element of white man's burden in our uh, continued stay in Iraq. What if they spoke Oxford English? What if it were a 94% Christian country instead of 94% Muslim? What if they were white, European looking? There is the idea that they have different morals, that they don't respect life the same way we do. Well, I agree with that, but not in the way that the right wing means it. This is a very good website. I'm sorry, I should change the color. Ifamericansnew.org. It's the distortion <coughs> of children's deaths in the occupied territories. And I will focus on what AP reported for Israeli children's deaths. For the children, Associated Press reports children, Israeli children's deaths more often than the deaths occurred, but omitted coverage of 85% of Palestinian children killed. So what does that translate into for the year of 2004? Actual number of Israeli children who died because of the actions of a Palestinian, eight. Actual number of Palestinians who died because of the actions of an Israeli, mostly IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, 179. What did we see in the Associated Press? 113% coverage, meaning that the story of the Israeli child's death was reported in more than one article or more than one headline. And that's not, you know, like, fine, do whatever you want, but you've got to be equal. Well, AP covered 15% of Palestinian children's deaths, which by percentage is still showing a lot of Palestinian children's deaths, but it's a distorted view. So let me be perfectly clear. I'm not saying that those eight Israeli deaths don't count. I'm saying that every one of the 179 deaths do. And in this country, when we have a distorted view like that, it's easier to buy into. They don't respect life the same way we do. And I believe that's true, but the reality is that we show less respect for their lives. And you can see it in Palestine, and you can see it in Iraq today. The agenda behind the racism that is perpetuated in the media is the state of Israel, which serves as our colonial outpost for control of the resources there. Oil. The occupation of Iraq is an extension of the occupation of Palestine, because now we got 14 big-ass military bases in Iraq, and, and about 60 others, smaller ones. There are joint American-Israeli operations in both Palestine and Iraq. And it is because of our blind military, political, and financial support for the Israeli occupation of Palestine that it continues. And of course, we're directly involved in Iraq to control the resources of Western Asia. The sentiment of they've been killing each other for thousands of years with us just shaking our heads. You know, these people, they're just so primitive and so violent. It's a myth. It's not the case. The problem of conflict came about when an injustice was affected. If you look at Palestine and Iraq, where you hear this uh, statement applied, this is the transition of Arab land given over to the colonizing European Jews who came. This is the problem. This is why there are seven million Palestinian refugees. What would you do if someone burst into your home in the middle of the night and locked up your family, took away the, the, any military-aged men, and then stuck you in the cellar and said, all right, this is, you're going to stay there now, and we own the house. <clears throat> it's not going to sit well with anybody if we respect humanity. In Iraq, same thing. Oh, they've been killing each other for thousands of years. No, not so much. Really, that myth started coming out in 2003. Now, was there something else that happened in 2003 that might have been an outside influence? Well, this is a statement by Iraqi scholar Sami Ramadan. The occupation sectarian discourse, the discourse on sectarian strife, has acquired a hold as powerful as the weapons of mass destruction fiction that prepared the public for war. 
Iraqis are portrayed as a people who can't wait to kill each other once left to their own devices. In fact, the occupation is the main architect of institutionalized sectarian and ethnic divisions. Its removal would act as a catalyst for Iraqis to resolve some of their differences politically. This is the age-old tactic of divide and conquer. We're not helping in Iraq. The only help they need is for us to get out. But minorities within our military. Now, when you see ads for the troops and promoting joining the military, support the troops, what gender are we usually thinking? Male. Of course. And that's not unreasonable because the majority of the military is male. But what class are we thinking of? Not wealthy, but certainly upwardly mobile. You know, someone who's going to go, and we see it in the ads, they're going to go and, and serve their country, and then they're going to come back and get an education. Not if Bush has anything to say about it. But generally, the idea that they're, you know, this is, they will accelerate um, and change their class in society. What race are we talking about? Dark. Dark is the truth, but the ads I see on yeah, TV, white. they're white. Yeah. yeah, the image is the few, the proud, flip up the sword. The Marine is white. Yes, always. But minorities are overrepresented in the U.S. military. And let me tell you, I've seen it in the airports. It is, it is a little upsetting when people see a woman in fatigues because that's a little bit shaming. Like, why is she going overseas? No, I want to feel good about sending the young, you know, patriotic man going over. But African Americans and Latinos, as well as poor whites, historically overrepresented. Now, recruitment is down because there's fewer African Americans signing up. They're catching on to the racism that is inherent in these occupations. The Aryan nation, we have to be really careful about preserving the military now because increasingly it is being comprised, and not in like vast, vast numbers yet, but increasingly they are lowering restrictions for convicted felons and members of the Aryan nation. But pretty much by the time you're done with basic training, if you weren't practicing white supremacy before, that's going to be instilled in you. Now, what's going to happen when the troops come home? <coughs> Many of them are going to go into law enforcement. And they're not going to get any treatment. They're not going to get any satisfactory treatment for their trauma or the brainwashing of the racism. There's going to be, already in Iraq, you have 1.2 million Sean Bells. What's going to happen here? We have to advocate for them being cared for when they come home. Not just for our own self-interest, for them too, but the reality is we pay for their care now or we pay as a society later. Yes. Not just you know support the troops and wave the flag. Uh-uh, support the troops is bringing them out of harm's way and helping them. This is Jessica Covey, 21 years old, died in Fallujah in October 2004. She doesn't come to mind when we're thinking about sacrifice. And neither does he, 37 years old. I will read you a statement from Muhammad Ali, one of the most famous war resistors, in the last time we went through this. No, I am not going 10,000 miles to help murder, kill, and burn other people to simply help continue the domination of white slave masters over dark people the world over. This is the day and age when such evil injustice must come to an end. No Viet Cong ever called me, you can read it, I just don't want to say it. Freedom means being able to follow your religion, but it also means carrying the responsibility to choose between right and wrong. So when the time came for me to make up my mind about going in the army, I knew people were dying in Vietnam for nothing, and I should live by what I, by what I thought was right. And now the whole world knows that. There are, if there are any, it's, it's by far the exception to the rule. Once you deploy, to Iraq and Afghanistan. You don't want to go back. If you make it out alive the first time, you don't want to go back. And, and the evidence that it's miserable there, to say the least, is that 15 soldiers and Marines are attempting to take their life every day. So let us chin those who refuse to go back and support them and help them. Because ultimately, not everybody has that extraordinary, can take that extraordinary leap to say goodbye to their unit and go on their own. Because the troops are disposable to our government. There is the holdout for this will all be worth something. This will be good in the end. But Henry Kissinger said military men are dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. That's Kissinger, architect of Vietnam, 
architect of Iraq, student of uh, Leo Strauss. This is all coming full circle. Yes. <laughs> Disposable immigrants, you want to come start a new life for yourself because our, uh, our trade policies have made it exceedingly difficult for Mexicans to uh, create a, a decent life for their families. They will cross the border in the hope for new life. They don't get shot at by the Minutemen, hopefully, and if they're caught, they will get rounded up and sent back home. Unless you want to become a member of the Army Armed Forces. And then your citizenship will be accelerated. Ladies and gentlemen, being sworn in as U.S. citizens at Al Fao Palace, Camp Victory, Baghdad. Welcome to America. Now, what immigrants are they appealing to? And this just says that they will accelerate because they know the sacrifice. They will accelerate citizenship. These are the immigrants they're appealing to. I see a lot of Irish immigrants here. Not a lot of European immigrants here. This, they are appealing to poor people, which are, and, and around the world, these are coming from Latin America. This is a big phenomenon, green card soldiers. So one of these things is not like the other, and I don't just mean that he's the general. There's a big race difference here. That's the reality on the ground. Class, we have a poverty draft in this country. You may be familiar with George Bush making jokes, taking pictures in the Oval Office, that those weapons of mass destruction have got to be here somewhere. But Jenna and her sister aren't going to Iraq or Afghanistan. It's young people who are looking for a way out of their own economic struggle. And I don't know the specifics of his signing up for the military, but he signed up and sent to fight a war based on lies and lost his both legs and his right arm. And he was sent to fight a war based on lies, an RPG went through his right leg, and he is now permanently disabled. And when they calculate the $3 trillion war, you can't put price on life, but they calculate what that person's financial <coughs> contribution to society would have been. And instead of being a young, healthy member of society, they are now dependent on a health care system for the rest of their lives. In Iraq, this is just an element of religion, which we didn't really get into that much, but this is a huge bomb crater uh, that is in front of a mosque. And I already told you, mosques are being leveled there. Once again, my cousin, but when I, uh, I, I think of him when I see something like this. But he doesn't. He just sees a potential enemy, I think. And these were engineering students, the graduating class from Al Anbar University in Ramadi in 2006. These are the young minds of Iraq today. Now, when you send the young, uneducated minds of America to meet the young minds of Iraq, this is what happens. Now, those, they're not the same people in the picture, but this is a, the, a metaphor. It's the epitome of what colonization is. Humiliation. You strip them of their dignity, rape and pillage. And I don't know if the young soldier in the middle recognizes that this is how his ancestors were brought to this country, chained to the bottom of slave ships. Like I said, you know, my father was an energy supremacist. Any one of us can fill any one of these roles. So I want to leave you with images of Iraqis as human beings winning the Asia Cup. Now you can go online and find out if uh, which players were Sunni and which were Shia and which were Kurd, but as you can see, it doesn't really matter to them. And when you think of Iraqis, you recognize people who love their families <coughs> and want to live their lives and pursue happiness the same way we do. So hopefully you keep these images in mind rather than the images that our government through our media want to leave us with. Um, I think it is important to have realistic goals. I can't hold out till the troops come home. We gotta have like victories before that happens, but but don't give up, no matter what. Iraqis have no choice and they're persisting for justice. We're persisting for justice together, we'll work together, and don't you dare give up until that last soldier comes home. Thank you so much for your attention. Sure. When I moderate and I speak at the same time, there's no control over me. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yes, Thank it you. was. Yes, we it have was. five minutes, and I was hoping there'd be more time for discussion, but we do have a little break before dinner. So, um, yeah, I will I'll call on you, and then if you gentlemen. Delilah, what did you say about Outback? Uh, Tommy Frank's own stock in it. He has a share.
So um, let me call on you. With my own research, I've noticed that the United States has used depleted uranium in 22 nations. The only nation that is white that it's used it in is the United States. I'm wondering if you've happened to notice, the, I've heard you talk about depleted uranium, the correlation between people of color and the use of radioactive weapons. Sure. Um, well, we've also, I mean, we used it in, the NATO, NATO used it in the bombing of Kosovo. We used it in Yugoslavia. Um, but generally speaking, uh, there is, um, you know, I, I, it's difficult for me to answer that question because I think of uh, the story Aaron Brockovich, which the only reason I know the story is because they made a big Hollywood movie about it. But that was a corporation uh, in middle America that didn't give enough of a damn about the people living right there to, uh, to cut their profits a little bit and do the right thing and protect those people from exposure. So if corporations will do that within this country, um, and I know the kind of racism that's out there, uh, I don't think they have any, you know, that's not going to hold them back from using it anywhere else. Um, so there are concepts out there of, um, of eugenics, that this is actual, like, depleted uranium is being used on purpose uh, to exterminate races. Um, frankly, I don't think... I don't give them that much credit. I think it's just like, it's just a side effect. The depleted uranium, I think it's an economic thing more than anything else. It's free. And, um, and it works on tanks really well. And if it screws up the people and the troops at the same time, oh well, you know, so did Agent Orange. But the Pentagon was happy with what that did. So that is absolute, and you know, the, I, I don't know that much more about like getting actual data. but. I will also say that Doug Rocky, who's done a lot of the research on depleted uranium, has documents to prove that there were some uh, uh, veterans of Desert Storm who had shrapnel embedded that, uh, that from, uh, from a DU explosion. And basically the memo said, we're going to leave it in and see what happens. Oh. Which is really echoes the Tuskegee experiment. Yes. Yes. Of, uh, this is an audience that knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> where uh, the doctors tracked syphilis in black patients. They just left it untreated just to see how the disease would progress. So, I, you know, it's difficult uh, to put it along. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, there are instances where class kind of supersedes race, so I, I'm probably not the expert on that. But there's certainly, yeah, like uh, everybody's, uh, everybody's paying a price for that. Um, I saw your hand. Oh, I had a couple comments. Um, one was about, um, I, well, I saw a picture, a cover of Newsweek about a year ago. It was a bunch of angry, young Pakistani man in front of the Red Mosque. And uh, I read later that there's a, a man in England who calls that Rage Boy. Um, the image you constantly see in the media of a young, hostile Muslim person is, he yes. calls it Rage Boy. And I, yes. I like that phrase because I use that now when I see that. I talk to people about it and yeah. say, you know, this image is, same image, it's probably the same guy that they just <laughs> photocopy and put all over, but maybe that's a, a talking point to people is just talk about that image of how it's the same image instead of showing this kid like eating, you know, and smiling or laughing with his nephew or kissing his girlfriend or whatever he's doing, it's always the same image and it's just so offensive to our humanity. Um, but that's one point I want to say. And then um, I want to speak about uh, uh, Robert was saying about. Um, Having realistic, realistic goals or realistic um, expectations of being honest with yourself. Um, sometimes it's hard to see changes happening in our in our world, and especially with our work. Um, as, this is more of a question, actually. Do you also can you also see that possibly like helping people around you, the people you love and friends, if you see changes in them through your work, is that something realistic that you can take as some type of victory to help you keep some type of positive energy going? Because I know myself, I often get down very easily about the overwhelming nature of it all. Um, so I, I guess there's this question about like what you do as an individual. Is it making individual changes? I mean, to all the people, or all the panelists, actually. Well, I, you know, this really doesn't speak to the, some people, the panel so much, but is there a mark? No, there's no marker. Oh, yeah. well, this sucks, but. It's okay. Here's the way I think about politics right now. Um, Here's, to, here's today, and here's a period that I will call the collapse, right, when this system goes down. 
which isn't going to be a moment in history. It, it's already collapsing, right? And it, that's being felt mostly outside of the U.S. Politics to me right now is about two things. One is about this period right now in which, because of the policies of the United States government primarily and other first world countries, there is incredible suffering around the world. And some of that suffering can be mitigated by what we do. In this period, I think we're going to go through a transition we cannot even imagine. Right? It's going to be a lot of things falling apart at once, social and cultural, as well as ecological and economic. And then there's going to be some period after that. And the, the two points I'm interested in are this period, what, what are our moral obligations by virtue of our privilege? And what's going to be on the ground here? Right? Now, those are in some sense two very different tasks, although there's lots of intersections between them. So one can work on things like anti-war activities or labor organizing here, trying to figure out how to contribute here, and also keep an eye on this point. And I think what's going to really matter here and, and I'll try and keep this tight, are two things, skills and stories. What, what skills are we going to need to live here after that period is over? One is clearly going to be about food and water, growing and preparing food and, and keeping water. The other is going to be about stories. What kind of, how are we going to replace the current story about what it means to be a person? Right? Because there's a story this culture tells us that most of us have internalized and often are trying to resist. Right? Now, while we're doing these things and up against the monster and having more defeats in the short term than victories, there's also this. And this is a source of joy in some sense because it's about the long term. It's about bringing people together mostly locally, I think, although sharing information and strategies. Right? And community building stuff you can do anywhere and that's always, re to me, that's always healthy. We're trying, I live in Austin, Texas. And I do a lot of these kind of things, and I fail at them most of the time in groups that fail, that are part of movements that fail, even though there are victories sometimes. And, and everybody, you know, both of you have been part of victories that are not trivial because they mitigate suffering. Right? There's a village in Palestine that gets a water system because somebody raised money here and sent it over. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen. But here is always a source of renewal for me. And I think if we keep that in mind, it's a lot easier to stay sane, to stay joyful, as you were saying, in the midst of the sorrow. But it has to be in a context of understanding what's coming, and I think that's one way to say what's coming. I like to thank Dalia for sharing your story. Oh, thank you. It's what I do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For talking about identity, how that changes, that gave me a lot of hopefulness, actually, um, thinking about how we're not fixed. Even our, even our enemies are human beings who are Yes. What should we do about the oil? About what? The oil, the influence that oil has and the need for how it's going to be. Well, we should take altern alternative energy yes. resources, but in the meantime, we should get oil the old fashioned way. Pay for it. <laughs> yes. yes. That's it. Our issue is who Iraq sells its oil to and how much of it it sells. And that's none of our business, because we don't live there. We got enough problems here at home to take care of. We don't want Iraq to sell oil to China, because China gets 75% of its oil from Iraq and Kuwait. Now, we already control the flow of oil from Kuwait, because we already control the ebb and flow of the Al-Sabah family that controls that country. But, uh, but Saddam Hussein was not going to say, yeah, uh, you know, I'll be your, I'll be your houseboy. Uh -uh. So we were like, all right, well, we will destroy Iraq. And another big reason for that was because Saddam Hussein wanted to change the currency of the oil for food program from the American dollar to the euro. Now, let me just say a disclaimer, I am not an economist by any stretch of the imagination. But all oil in the world is dealt with the American dollar. And at the time that Saddam Hussein wanted to do that switch, the euro was like a baby. It was like it wasn't as valuable as the American dollar. So the euro was here, and we were here. But <laughs> the concern with the Project for a New American Century was that if Iraq switched, then other countries were going to start switching. And 
the dollar would start devaluing, possibly putting us into a recession, which is coming anyway, um, and then might trigger a world recession. So I think basically the solution for our economy is for us to switch to the euro. What do you think? I'm joking. I'm not. I'm not I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's the reality. It's really, it's really about the dollar. It's about the dollar and our supremacy as a world superpower and keeping China in check saying, no, you can't have the oil. So what China is doing is going to Africa. And, and they're saying, rather than saying, if you don't sell the oil, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. They're going and they're saying, you know, how about you sell us some oil and we'll like build some hospitals or libraries or something. And it's driving us crazy. Do you know where they want to get oil from? Sudan. <coughs> That is why our government has declared a genocide in Darfur. Despite the fact that there are more than twice as many casualties in Iraq in the same period of time, that's not a genocide. It is a genocide in Darfur because we want a, an excuse to bring in the military and therefore, once again, control the resources there. So if the administration comes to the American people and says, we want you to send your sons and daughters to go die for the dollar, you know, we were already like, um, I'm not too sure about what you want us to do, but send them to go fi fight for the dollar? No, no freaking way. But we were scared after September 11th, and we were lied to and told Saddam Hussein did it, and he has nuclear weapons, and he can magic switcheroo, put them together in 45 <laughs> minutes, and like send them over. Well, the latest argument is that we got to fight him over there so that we don't fight him over here. <laughs> The Iraqi Air Force and Navy were destroyed in the first Gulf War. They're not known for their strength in swimming. So, there's really no other place to come from to attack us. But that's the reality, that it's about economics. And there's certainly, I do strongly believe that there's a way to do this uh, without, uh, without committing genocide and bankrupting every, everybody else. That's a long way. I think the thing to do about oil is to redefine a good life. I think the reality is that in a, in a world where the good life is defined by the acquisition of material things and the system that produces those material things is dependent on oil, it's an oil-based infrastructure. If people see themselves and their happiness that way, uh, even people who might have resistance to certain kinds of violent means to retain the ability to acquire that oil, will abandon that resistance if the world, if the government tells them this is what you need if you want to keep going to Best Buy. And I think until we redefine what the conception of a good life means, the vast majority of the American population will capitulate to most anything. Right? Remember what, you know, the United States population has capitulated to incredible brutality in history. And I don't see any reason to think that all of a sudden will stop. And I think, in fact, it will intensify as long as its own material self-interest is tied to that oil, which means we have to redefine what one's self-interest means. That's, I think, the most fundamental, I mean, that's a big picture kind of response. But I think that's actually at the heart of what has to happen. Yes. I was just going to make a comment. I, I think the greatest resource on Earth, you know, is not gas, not oil, not even water. It's human. Until we start to recognize the humanity in all of this and start to talk about a, you know, one global vision, one global community, and, and recognize and put the value on, on each independent person, uh, you know, it's, it's a value system that needs to be rearranged. Well, I think Cheney would be into that, but slavery's been abolished, so um, there's no more human trouble. Joke, people, joke. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next question. <laughs> Actually, it, it's, it's not disconnected. For most, of the, for most of human history, the ability to produce the affluence that we experienced was a result of some form of slavery. Oil has replaced slavery to a large degree. The concentrated energy of oil, coal, and natural gas is very, very unique in human history. And it's allowed systems to abandon on supposedly moral grounds things like slavery. And it's not impossible to imagine that when that energy goes away, if that conception of human happiness as tied to affluence remains, that we will return to that. I mean, I, I know you were joking, but I don't, in some ways, I don't think it's a joke. So, so why are you affluent for what happens after the collapse? Pardon? Why are you, why are you optimistic of what happens after the collapse? Now we're in hypertrophy. 
I didn't say shit about being optimistic. I'm not optimistic about anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm not optimistic. I think that even, at, as Mazin was saying, even in conditions of great suffering, one tries to retain one's own humanity, connect with other people who have a similar sense of humanity, and believe in the possibility. And if that's what can be the motive force. If you mean optimistic, like I think 6.5 billion people are going to continue to live on this planet, no. I, I'm, I would consider myself realistic on the, the tragedy that exists on the planet already and is going to magnify it. Within that, we have a moral obligation to continue, both for our own self and for those that we're morally connected to, which is, from the U.S., everybody in the world. I may add to that. I think our, our position here in, the, in a group like this and the people that work along the lines that we work on, of course, we have diverse interests. We have people interested in, in all sorts of things. I was, you know, I'm interested in many things also myself, but, but even within this room, we'll find about a hundred different specific interests. But I think what needs to unify us is specifically this concept that we need to educate people. And Kathy Kelly, I think, articulated this very well. We need to educate people about the causes and the consequences of their own actions, and as Howard Zinn said it, of being on that train. You know, you can't be neutral on a moving train. You are part of this train, and the train is heading towards a cliff. And you either get off the train or go grab the, uh, you know, the wheels or something. You have to do something. You cannot just sit around and say, well, it's not me who's driving, you know, there is a driver, you know. That, that is the essence of being involved and being active, and, and that is why it's so important. And by being there and by providing that answer, I was just last week at the communal farm in Wisconsin where they consume very little oil-based products. They use solar energy, have composting toilets, they grow their own agriculture, you know, and we have, you know, that, and it's also a peace community. And they provide the answer. And you know Mike Miles, who runs that community, he said to me, he said, you know what I'm afraid of? I said, what? He said, I'm afraid of when that collapse that you talk about happened, that their farm is going to be flooded by hundreds of people from the surrounding community because they can live on their own, you know? We have grown to be complacent about our lives. And what is happening now with the shock of the food prices, with the, with the homes going down in value, with the dollar going down in value, with oil shooting up, is just signals. So with Katrina and what happened in Katrina, signals. More and more people are becoming open to hear our point of view. We need to, to take advantage of that to tell them what they need to do, which is what you are saying, what they need to do to survive in this world in a, in a sustainable way and, and in a communal way and recognize what's important is not what kind of car you drive or whatever. Well, when it's time to die, what is going to be important is what good have you done? What, what have you done? So I think that's where our role comes in and that's why I'm much more optimistic than you, Robert. I think humanity, I mean, it, 50 years ago you would not have had the stories that I told you or the stories that uh, Daria told you with her parents being in Ashkenazi and in Iraq and whatever. People are mixing up. People are communicating. We, in this room, we are mixing up. There's the internet. We have resources. We have, we are at a much better position to use some aspects of technology, not the bad aspects, not the depleted uranium nuclear, whatever, but to use some good aspects of technology, like the internet, to really affect real change in society, and I am seeing it everywhere. I mean, how many communal farms exist today as there was 50 years ago, as compared to 50 years ago, or those communities that are self-sustaining? You see it everywhere. How many, you know, is his food not bombs, you know, which was uh, the seminar we heard earlier today. You know, he said over a thousand people are engaged in food not bombs around the world, a thousand groups, I mean. So, so it is, it is becoming much more doable. I think we need to, to, to focus less on the narrow and more on the general. What's the name of the communal farm in Wisconsin? Anathoth, A-N-A-T, 
H O T H, which is after a biblical name of a city in Palestine that Jesus visited. <laughs> Um, I see one more hand, but I think it's already, we're pretty far over. Um, so I think probably we should, um, we should like stop here and, um, but pick up the conversation later. Um, we'll try to cheer Bob up. Um, and, <laughs> um, no, but thank you all so much for your interest and for